When I was in medical school, we were taught that the only way to change your genes is to change your parents, meaning you can't do anything about it. Um, but we, we did a study with Craig Venter, who was the first to decode the human genome. And we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months, same lifestyle changes, turning on the good genes, turning off the bad genes in simple terms. And there are mechanisms. There is something called um, methylation, which is a molecule that kind of acts like a switch that can turn on or turn off a gene. Technically, the genes are the same, but the expression of the genes, if you can turn off a gene that causes cancer, then it's as though you're changing your genes or yeah. what are called different proteins, histone and non-histone proteins that act as switches and sirtuins and others that turn on and turn off the genes. And we found that over 500 genes were changed in just three months. Now, I mentioned earlier that I've been working with President Clinton since 1993, mm -hmm. uh, when, when he first became president. He's talked about this publicly, I wouldn't even mention it. Right. And about 14 years ago, after his bypass surgery, uh, his uh, had clogged up, his cardiologist, one of his cardiologists held a press <sighs> conference on CNN and said, oh, it was all in his genes, his diet and lifestyle had nothing to do with it. And having been working with him for so long, I knew it had everything to do with it. So I sent the president an email. I said, look, the friends I value the most are the ones who tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. And you need to know that it's not all in your genes. And I say that not to blame you, but to empower you. Because if it were all in your genes, you'd be uh, a victim. And you're not a victim. You're one of the most powerful guys on the planet. And so he began making these changes and he's still doing it. I communicated with him recently. Uh, he's getting better. And, you know, it's it, whatever your politics, I think it's a great example that especially someone who was known for eating, you know, so much uh, an unhelpful diet, if he can do it, then anybody can do it. But it's, it's part of the bigger issue that in the Undo It book, I, I put forth this new unifying theory that, you know, I was trained like most doctors to view heart disease, type two diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, prostate cancer, breast cancer, Alzheimer's disease as being fundamentally different diseases, different diagnoses and different treatments. And yet we found over these four decades that these same lifestyle changes we've been talking about can not only prevent, but often reverse the progression of all of these con different conditions. And we're still looking into Alzheimer's um, and something like it's kind of the opposite of this whole personalized medicine trend. Like, why is that? And I realized it's because they're not so different from each other. They all share the same underlying biological mechanisms, things like chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in immune function, changes in overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, changes in the microbiome, the hundred trillion cells in our gut that coexist with us, and uh, angiogenesis and so on. And each one of these biological mechanisms in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. You know, eat well, move more, stress less, love more. And so when you make these changes, and it also helps explain why we find what are often called comorbidities that the same patient will have high blood pressure and high cholesterol and be overweight and have heart disease and so on, because they all are just different expressions of the same underlying disorder or why, you know, as Colin Campbell showed in the China study that entire countries, you know, like in Asia 50 years ago had such low rates of these chronic conditions until they start to eat like us and live like us. And now they die like us, you know, more often than not with the same kind of conditions that we die from. And so it radically simplifies what we tell people because it's not like there's one diet for heart disease, a different one for type two diabetes or different for Alzheimer's, whatever. It's the same for all of them. And we're now in the middle of doing the first randomized trial to see if we can reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease, which I'm particularly interested in because my mom died of it and all of her siblings. And I have one of the APOE4 genes for it. And you know, when you lose your memories, you lose everything. And unlike these other conditions, they're all, at least they're other things you can do if you've got heart disease or diabetes that have benefit, but nothing really works for Alzheimer's. They're the only, they've had one new drug approved in the last 20 years, and they spent billions and billions of dollars trying to find them. And the one drug that got approved, there's a lot of controversy around called aducanumab because it's uh, one study showed it didn't do anything. The other said it slowed down the rate of getting worse a little bit. About a third of people end up with brain hemorrhages and it's $56,000 a dose and so on. And so my belief is that where to place with Alzheimer's is very reminiscent of where we were with heart disease 40 something years ago. In other words, back then, less intensive lifestyle changes slowed down the rate at which your arteries got clogged. We found more intensive ones could actually get them less clogged over time to reverse the disease progression. You know, ounce of prevention, pound of cure. It's hard to reverse disease. It takes a lot to do that. And likewise, the uh, finger study and other studies have shown that less in the same lifestyle, you know, it's good for your heart is good for your brain and vice versa less intensive lifestyle changes can slow the rate of getting Alzheimer's. My theory is, again, that maybe more intensive ones might stop or reverse it. So we're still recruiting the last group of patients. And if anyone out there 
has early stage Alzheimer's, go to, again, go to our website, ornish.com, where now we, we were forced to do the intervention by Zoom two years ago when COVID-19 hit. And to my great surprise, if anything good came out of COVID, it was learning that we could do it by Zoom as well as we do it in person. So now we're collaborating with the heads of neurology at Harvard and Mass General, at the Cleveland Clinic. Well, we soon hopefully do it at the Cleveland Clinic, but also we're doing it at University of California, San Diego, at Renown, as well as in the Bay Area where they're recruiting and testing the patients locally, but we're delivering the intervention from our staff via Zoom. So, and then drop shipping the food to you. We're providing 21 meals a week for the entire 40 weeks of the intervention. So you can live pretty much anywhere and be eligible for the study. So I'm hopeful that we can um, show that time will tell, uh, whatever we show will be important, but if we can show that we can stop mm -hmm. or even reverse it, that potentially could give millions of people a uh, new hope and new choices in an area that nothing else really is working in. So stay tuned. Yeah, I just have one specific question right on that. It, and it, 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 I'm wondering if the answer has to do in blood flow. This is like me pre-asking if I'm right. Um, what would be the difference in a gene expression from a meal of a sweet potato and a blueberry versus a, a cheeseburger? Like what, what will that sweet potato turn off maybe in a, in a precancerous gene? Yeah, I don't know that it's one meal or one item, but or pattern, ten sweet potato you know, meals or twenty, just like those food differences. Yeah, well, there's there's something called the RAS family RAS family oncogenes. Oncogenes are genes that promote cancer, and we found that we downregulated those, turned them off uh, in in this study. These are the genes that cause prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, just turned off within three months. You know, whereas we're turning on the genes that. Uh, our, our, our healing. And we also turned off the genes that cause these same biological mechanisms that we've been talking about, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, et cetera. We're just, you know, turned off. It's too, you know, the thing that continues to amaze me is how dynamic these changes are and how quickly people can get better or worse. We did a study with Elizabeth Blackburn who got the Nobel prize for discovering telomeres, the ends of our chromosomes that regulate aging. Uh, they're kind of like the plastic tips on the end of your shoelace to keep your shoelace from unraveling. They keep our DNA from unraveling, if you will. And as our DNA replicates over the years, the telomeres get shorter and shorter. And as your telomeres get shorter, your life gets shorter. And the risk of premature death from all these different chronic diseases we've been talking about goes up proportionate to that. And she had done studies with Alyssa Eppel showing that things, you know, people who eat junk food, their telomeres get shorter faster. So there's people who are under chronic stress, women who are taking care of kids with autism or people who uh, smoke cigarettes or who are sedentary or you know, whatever, their telomeres got shorter faster. So I said, you know, if bad things make your telomeres get shorter faster, maybe good things make them longer. And so she said, no, I don't think so. I said, well, let's find out. So to her great credit, we did a study together and we found from the first time that we could actually lengthen telomeres. Um, and when we published this, the Lancet editor sent out a press release worldwide and they called it first study showing that lifestyle changes may reverse aging at a cellular level. So whatever lens we look at this through, it just shows you, I think it's one of the reasons why a panel of experts from US News and World Report that rate diets every year uh, in January, a few months ago, rated what they call the Ornish diet as number one for heart health uh, for the 11th year since 2011 that they began rating diets. That it's not just heart disease though, it's all of these different conditions because they're all interrelated.